rotational variables. So until now, all the motion you have studied aside from UCM as being rectilinear. representation. Now this is not just designed so that uh, students can finish up and then watch cartoons. This is also because uh, we might be automating this. We might be putting it in software or whatever else and or even just a simple matter of fewer mistakes. If the uh, uh, system can be better represented and more easily represented. So let's toy with this briefly, and I'm going to probably make a mess of this, but so if we take first, for example, a circle, and for simplicity's sake, because I don't want to think that hard, we'll put it at the origin. So in uh, Cartesian form, we have everyone's favorite equation, x squared plus y squared equals some r squared. In polar form, uh, it's simply a constant. So you go from this equation where you have squares and potential square roots and all kinds of trouble to just a simple r equals a constant. So there's, you can't get any simpler than that. Uh, you could uh, align from the origin. <clears throat> You can have in Cartesian form y equals mx. In polar form, you have theta equals a constant. In either case, they're pretty close. It's not too different. Uh, where the trouble really comes, where the sparks start to fly, is when you move off the origin. Okay? You've got a complex equation here. It's going to get complicated for many cases, uh, and that's where it gets trickier. Okay? So, but nevertheless. Uh, if we have a straight line that's off the origin, like y equals mx plus b, uh, then the polar version gets complicated. Okay? Uh, when you see equations of conics that are in polar form, aside from this simplistic case, they're, they're more involved a little bit. And it's hard to decide whether an ellipse equation of uh, x squared over a squared plus y squared over b squared equals 1 is easier than, say, R is equal to some blah or theta sine and, and all the rest. So it's hard to be sure sometimes which way these things work out. You'll have the privilege of both because when I prove Kepler's first law for you, 
um, the result will be an equation in polar form. Because when we prove Kepler's first law, for example, like I said here a minute ago with nature, it is easier to model orbits using polar equations than it is to use Cartesian. On the other hand, if we use a computer, we always use Cartesian, uh, but because we don't care. Uh, because we can easily, within the computer program, convert the velocity vector x, y, z, or sorry, the position vector x, y, z, and the velocity vector x dot, y dot, z dot into some kind of uh, transformation that tells us what the orbit's doing. And because the computer is so fast, we can really do things in a flat-footed way that you wouldn't dare do uh, with a pencil. So anyhow, so there's some justification, perhaps this isn't uh, rigid justification, but it's some justification as to why we would choose a system that is uh, quasi-parallel uh, to another one. <clears throat> but whether I've convinced you or not, we're doing it anyway. Uh, So the rotational variables so we will examine a motion of a rigid body Axis so there'll be no procession. We have to leave something for university, I suppose. So we're not going to be dealing with fluid spheres and differential rotation rates, all that kind of stuff. Uh, we get the beginnings done right, and one of the things about this that's important is when you become aware of a particular type of motion and we cover the basics and if a professor picks up and does more with it you realize you're still operating from the same basics it's just more complicated and somehow that's easier than not knowing the foundation of it at least that's for me anyway so in this chapter uh, we consider only pure rotation. In <clears throat> chapter 11, we have rotation and translation together, and that equals rolling. Okay, we'll get there, but uh, we'll do this first. An axis of rotation, I kind of mentioned this already, should realize with rotation is that the axis of rotation is not a fixed and it's not a property. Uh, I can, I'll take my uh, baton here, <clears throat> I can spin it this way and so the axis of rotation is going through it or I could roll it this way and the axis of rotation is going through it or I can do something uh, completely different. So the axis of rotation is, 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 is really up to us by choice. It might take more uh, torque or not less torque to make it happen but in the end the uh, axis of rotation uh, is, is a property of a particular motion. <clears throat> so when that's changed, that can change a bunch of other things too. So it becomes a really important consideration. <clears throat> so when an object rotates, in each particle, And you might call that a DM if you want to be, uh, so the minuscule part of it uh, will circle around a given point. If we connect these points, Uh, we will have an axis of rotation. So 
let's just, um, I don't have any artistic skills at all, but we'll give it a whirl here for a second. So we have some amorphous object here that's spinning in this direction. So we'll choose a couple of mass, a couple of DMs. And so a particle here arbitrarily is following this circular path as it rotates, or as this thing happens. And another particle here, let's suppose, is following this path. So there's a center point here and a center point here. <clears throat> and if you connect them, this is your axis of rotation. Now, obviously, there'd be n particles. <clears throat> and if it's a, a solid extended object, which typically would be in most cases, there's going to be 10 to the 21 particles or whatever. But so that your axis is well established. Okay? And again, we could spin this any way we want. So if you change this motion, you could make the axis what you want. So we should make a point of that. <clears throat> The axis of rotation is <coughs> um, a variable of the motion. Now, what we're saying by that is that <clears throat> when we decide when the thing is going to rotate, we will leave the axis alone. It will not preset or change. But prior to that, when you're deciding what motion you can have, you can pretty much do anything you want to. <clears throat> All right, let's get into the nuts and bolts of these variables. <clears throat> So star, you can use the units given below. Except when calculus is required. In that case, all angles are radians. Now what you can do, of course, is when you're finished your derivation, whatever it is, you can then put multipliers on the in the function to convert your angle or the result of whatever it is, uh, or the input angle, two degrees, if you want to do it that way. But Make sure that when you're affecting the integration differentiation, whatever it is, that you stick with radian measure. Or uh, I guess you can get around it, but you want to be real careful because uh, it, you know it's just putting a fork in a toaster here, and you've got it's a, it's a simple thing. If we're gonna make mistakes. Let's make mistakes on difficult stuff. Okay, <clears throat> anger position. So this is an angle <clears throat> measured from an agreed fiducial to the <clears throat> location of the object. Radians, there's no S, okay? So it's rad. 
no matter how many you have. A couple of other points here that I'll say just because they come to mind. I'm always afraid I'm going to forget it instead. So we're dealing with a, a planet or a spacecraft that's orbiting. This tends to show up. There's a distinction between a revolution and an orbit. So I just thought I'd tell you, and this is the kind of subtlety of nomenclature that if you were to show up in a situation like that and you use that language properly, they're impressed by that because it shows that you paid attention or you took AP physics, whichever. Now, the orbit is a path in the sky. And if a spacecraft is orbiting, it's following a particular path. All right, that's fine. But how many times it goes around the path is the number of reps. So it's not the fifth orbit. It's the fifth revolution. Okay, so there's, the orbit is a path in space. If it's the fifth orbit, that means you have five different paths in space and you're picking one of them. But the fifth rev means that you're following the same path, but just simply gone around five times in this example. Now, the other thing that happens that normally doesn't happen is for more than one rev, Uh, the value of theta is not emphasis mod 360 or mod mod one graph say it is allowed to accumulate so you might have theta equals 48 pi would be 24 reps. And what, why, why we do this is this allows for winding. So winding up a rope or something like this around a spindle or whatever uh, allows for that type of thing. So it's not, it's not uh, lost as a, a modulus. but we'll say it anyway. So delta theta is equal to theta 2 minus theta 1. I should point out also, I forgot I'm up here top, is that counterclockwise is positive and clockwise rotation is negative. So you can just say the clocks are negative. Now this uh, angular displacement thing is almost never used. Uh, almost all the time we simply start at zero and we use theta, not delta theta, as our angular variable. Okay? So I should point out here, this is generally more taken as a difference. This most resulted in a rotation of so many radians uh, from time one to time two or something like that, that kind of thing. But when we talk about the motion and we're modeling it, we almost never use delta theta. So not using derivations. Angular position slash displacement is going to be theta of t. <clears throat> so even though it just feels like we're kind of bending the rules a little bit, we are. showing you the relationship between the angular variables and the linear ones. This is surprisingly close. <clears throat> angular velocity. That's uh, so a lowercase omega just for minus once again. All right, I think I already spoke of that, but just uh, to be blunt. So we have omega average is equal to 
delta theta over delta t is equal to theta 2 minus theta 1 over t2 minus t1, like you'd expect it to be. Uh, the average is always a finite difference. Okay, and in that case, you can make an argument for using this. Sorry to interrupt your class. Safety monitor is coming to pick up your attendance. So, to all the teachers, please put your attendance outside your class. Thank you, and have a great day. Instantaneous angular velocity, of course, we never write instantaneous. No one does that. So, this is just going to be equal to omega, which is equal to theta dot, which is equal to d theta dt. And so now we have rev per second, degrees per second, which doesn't usually get used much, and radians per second. Now, I recommend when you use radians per second that you leave a blank between blank space. So many people write RADS uh, to mean radians. And if you just do that and put the reciprocal, it might imply one over radians. And people might not want to do that. If you leave a space, there's no ambiguity. And it's not that much to ask. Mm. We take the, of course, this is direction sensitive. So once again, it's negative. If it's clockwise, positive, it's counterclockwise. So the angular position can be positive and the angular velocity can be negative, right? Because you can do both. And angular speed, it's just the, we don't really use vector hats for this too much, but just taking the magnitude, the absolute value of it, gives you the angular speed. And this is always greater than zero, right? Because it's a speed, so there's no such thing as negative speed. acceleration. We use alpha for this. And just like before, these are things we probably already know, but we'll write them out just for short. It's delta omega over delta t is omega 2 minus omega 1 divided by t2 minus t1. For the average version, and then we have alpha is equal to omega dot is equal to theta double dot is equal to the omega dt is equal to d2 theta dt squared. And our units overwhelmingly will be gradients per second squared. You might see rabs, uh, but this is going to be the unit of choice for sure. When you get into angular acceleration, you don't have the same day-to-day -day usage. If I say to you the position of the thing is 70 degrees, or I say it's you know 1.843 radians, only nerds know what that means. But when we get into angular acceleration, if I say to you that the angular acceleration is 70 degrees per second squared, you don't know what the hell that means either. So we generally find that as soon as we get away from angular position, uh, the uh, angular speeds and acceleration are often just left in radians. Uh, they're already calculus-based ideas anyway, and, uh, and we don't have anywhere near the feel, if you will, for uh, angular acceleration and or velocity in radians, or sorry, in uh, degrees and or revs. So we bother, generally don't bother. So we already talked about uh, vector aspects. I think I'm going to just say this one thing. It's kind of interesting. Um, so I mentioned already the right-hand rule, and you go, I think, uh, well, I was kind of saying clockwise, let me see if that was basically saying here. Yeah, okay. So that's basically what I've already been saying, so I think that's fine. Uh, you might ask, for example, when we get off the Earth, we're in the solar system or somewhere, and you've got planets spinning or wherever they are, um, how do we decide which way is up and down to get a counterclockwise, you know, clockwise thing? I mean, because you know, you're, you're in this universe thing. So the convention is the following. If you look down upon the pole of a planet or star, 
and the rotation you observe is counterclockwise, you are officially north of the object. All right, now, that's true for the primary direction of the system. So, for example, here on Earth, you have the sun uh, rotating in a certain direction. And the sun's the, the elephant in the schoolyard, or the elephant in the room, or whatever. So the sun is going to be the, de the defining characteristic. And the general motion of the solar system follows the rotation of the sun, because it's probably the rotation of the solar nebula before all this started. So, so that would be, if we look down and we see that whole thing moving counterclockwise, then we say, okay, we're, this is the north side of the fundamental plane. Uh, now, that being said, you have some uh, asteroids and comets that don't behave themselves, that were captured or something like that. So what happens there is we have a property called inclination. So if you have the, you know, their plane of orbit is like, you know, canted somewhat this way, well, theirs is, you know, literally 170 degrees or something. So in other words, we take it over and just put it upside down, or, you know, I may not be exactly upside down, but something like that. And we'll learn more about that in a little while. But it is interesting when we get into these different situations, how we classify things, because the nomenclature classification aspects of things is really important to, uh, to all science so that we can speak the same language. <clears throat> All right, now, so now the interesting part would be to relate these angular variables to the translational variables you've already learned. Radian measure is the uh, the amount of the unit circle that's been subtended by the angle. And of course, if you have an angle that's bigger or smaller, then you have to scale it up by the radius. And it's a straight multiple, thankfully. Mm. So then we would have ds dt is equal to d theta dt uh, r. Now r. Uh, in this case would be considered a constant and so therefore it's not affected by the cups you don't have a product rule here uh, whereas if we do elliptical motion for example then both are a variable and it makes it more interesting as you will soon see with Kepler's first law now let's see what we get here <clears throat> so the SDT becomes V and the theta TT is omega and you get omega R rotating incorrectly here, but I'll explain why in a minute, uh, is the same. Otherwise, the object would come apart. You have all these particles inside the potato rotating around this axis, okay? And so they all go around at the same amount of rotation. So the parts on the inside don't move very quickly. The ones on the outside move much more fast, much more rapidly, rather. And so, but their period of rotation is the same. So we would have something like this. The period is equal to 2 pi r over v, which is equal to tau is equal to 2 pi omega. And this would be more of the translational world and the polar worlds here. For acceleration, We have dv 
dBt is equal to the omega dT r. Uh, a is equal to alpha r. Mm. But so for circular motion, which we already learned, we had our acceleration, our subthermal acceleration equal to v squared over r. When we substitute, you get, well, v is omega r, so we're going to get omega squared r squared over r, which gives us omega squared r. If I wrote something else on the other one, I was wrong. So this is correct, what you're seeing here. So if it, I did so, I apologize. Now this is the easy part. The fun part is the following. In linear motion, everything moves at the same amount. Every particle moves the same amount. Every particle has the same speed. So we have one uh, mv, one half mv squared. And so the momentum is mv. It's very straightforward. But in rotational motion, it becomes a problem because the particles near the center are moving very quickly and the particles further out are moving far more rapidly. And if we're looking at momentum or energy computations, for, especially for kinetic energy, we have a problem. We have to find a way to correct for this. Now, if we imagine the, my baton here, if I turn it this way, there's a certain amount of kinetic energy. If I spin it this way, there's a different one. Now, it doesn't take much effort to determine that it's very easy to do this. And it takes a lot more effort to stop this thing from spinning and going back the other way. Okay? So there's clearly a very great distinction in the energy involved between the two uh, modes of rotation, even though it's the same device. Whereas in transitional motion, whatever way this thing was doing, and all of it was going, so if I fired it like a javelin, or I threw it like this, whatever, if they're going the same velocity, their kinetic energy is exactly the same. So orientation of the rotational axis now becomes really important. Now back to this other point for a second, when I said I was using the word rotation incorrectly. So we want to be clear, once again, about another uh, bugaboo about notation and language. <clears throat> and it's easy to fall into this, and we all do it at times. So if we have a central axis, we have a, a, some object here, and it's rotating, then the center of mass, this, the axis, goes through the center of mass, okay? So a rotating object, pure rotation, will have the center of mass uh, on the axis. However, even though that's true, as I said a few minutes ago, you have a particle that is clearly removed from that and is uh, tracing a path that is not on the axis, but is going around the axis outside of it. Now, it's still held in place by the mass and the chemical bonds of the object, of course. But that particular VM here, it's center of mass is not on the axis and so it is revolving about the axis so even though the object taken as an entire entity is rotating and that's true. The individual particles are largely revolving, except the ones right on the axis. Now, that's the same thing as we have the sun here, and we have the earth like this. We know enough that the earth is rotating, which gives us our days and nights, and that's legit. So the earth 
rotates on its axis. But as you are, we're all grateful for as well, the Earth's center of mass is not inside the sun. It is tracing a path, be it elliptical or otherwise, outside the sun, like so. And that path then is a, it, the, a, the act of revolving around the sun. So this planetary metaphor here is the best one for you to envision it because it's something we talk about and people will talk about the sun rotating around the sun or the earth rotating around the sun and stuff. They use the words casually and in the cafeteria, I don't care what you do, but anytime in a professional environment, you have, words matter and words in many ways are your advertisement. Uh, if you're careless about words and, and what you write in your papers or even when you speak to uh, people who you or your social peers in these situations, uh, you will find that uh, you lose face, you lose respect, because it implies that you couldn't be bothered. Okay? Now, once in a while, you just don't know, but you couldn't be bothered, and it really makes a difference. And and so and now it's, there's less chance of the problem because you can get you know recordings on YouTube or, or on uh, Wikipedia or whatever it is of how to say some of these words. Uh, where in the old days you kind of hope someone would tell you, or, or even the distinctions here. Okay, and it does matter. Okay. You know, there's lots of people die just because people get the prescription because they get the wrong, they get the drugs mixed up because the names are so similar. You get something in some a drug end, ending in ene or ain and it makes a big difference what happens. And we have to be careful. And so as young scientists, even now, um, building a discipline to be correct with your language, whether it's biology, chemistry, or physics, not important, uh, is, is essential uh, to your habits that you want to form as you become a young professional. Okay. So let's look at this then, and we'll deal with it as a kinetic energy question, because it's certainly a good place to start. first, just briefly, we will say uh, T is either um, purely translational, actually you know what, that, that, that takes care of it all, it is the total kinetic energy of an object. So up to now, when we figured the kinetic energy, we didn't say T sub T or something like that. We just said T or in last year E sub K uh, equal to whatever, okay? Uh, but now we have to be careful because we got two of them. And T sub R will be rotational kinetic energy. And we will always use T sub R because we're not going, even though T sub R may equal T, uh, we're going to calculate T sub R first, and if we realize there's no translational kinetic energy, fair enough, then we'll just roll it over. But soon enough, we'll have both. Okay? And uh, you may also, and so sometimes, but comparatively rarely, T sub T for a translational component. I shouldn't say component because it implies it's a factor. Translational aspect of uh, T. Uh, in a rotational situation, in a rolling case. So here you would have T is equal to T sub R plus T sub T, for example, okay? But we generally only do that when we're, uh, you know, got both of these things working with. If we're dealing only with a trans rotational situation, we're going to use T sub R, and when we're satisfied, we'll just roll it over to total kinetic energy. Uh, if we're back where we were, up to now, we just use T. Don't make it needlessly complicated, okay? Now again, none of this is that difficult. It's just a matter of getting used to the conventions so that you're not surprised. And you may recall in June, uh, if you're not sure why I've got the T here, and for some reason, the remains beyond pale. By second year, uh, kinetic energy becomes T instead of Ke sub K. 
and potentials become V even if they're not electrical. Uh, or unless you're reading Feynman's book where they become A, all right? And I think the whole idea is just that we have to have a secret decoder ring to be able to study the subject of physics, but whatever seems to be frustrating. So I've found that it's easy to think of temperature and volume because you're more comfortable with those. And if you end up with uh, uh, doing second year or something like that, and it's pretty hard courses and their different equations and all that stuff going on, and then you start thinking of temperature volume, so the kinetic energy and potential energy, uh, you can get law, you can, you, you can have literacy troubles reading the, reading the language. So I thought adapting you this year by doing this uh, now, if, if your first year professor goes back to E sub K or something like that, you're going to be fine. So I'll be looking for this in your uh, problem sets, things like that. Uh, I'm a little more forgiving on a test because I recognize you're all terrified anyway. And I don't want to be unreasonable uh, on those, but I'm going to look when you've had time to think about it, and certainly in papers too, okay, if, if it's relevant. Okay, now said. Let's go over to a new board then. So, um, in a linear case, then the kinetic energy is simply equal to the sum, well, one half the sum of uh, mk vk squared to the n. And that's the easy stuff. Okay, we know this. For an angular variable, For an angular case, so we can just do it by substitution. We could say uh, t is equal to one half over n times m the sub k, and then in parenthesis we have our definitions are rubbed out, but the v is equal to omega r, right? So we'll have omega r quantity squared, and the omega is constant, but the r could be variable. Okay, because the radius of the particle anywhere inside the thing is going to change, but the rotation speed in the radians per second is going to stay fixed. So then we can recast this by saying one half times the sum of mk rk over n, uh, and then We'll put that in parenthesis times omega squared because it's a constant, right? And I've got squared. There we go. Now better. So what we want to look at now is what is this quantity here? <clears throat> So the sigma mk rk squared um, represents the behavior of the mass. Uh, <clears throat> define I capital equals this sum of mk uh, rk squared and is known as the rotational inertia. I believe it's also known as the moment of inertia. Yes, it is. So depending on whose book you read, something like that. Okay. Now, you'll certainly recognize it by the equation as well. So, it's, it's, no, there's no secret here. This is the only one for this kind of thing. Now, star, exclamation mark. I is specific to the axis of rotation. So, 
So as I uh, made it clear a few moments ago, the axis of rotation can be pretty much anything. Now after we've set it, we leave it alone, there's no precession. But the point here is, is that uh, you choose a different one, that's obviously going to mess around with these R's. Even if the MK's are the same, these R's are going to change a lot, and that's going to change what this is. So if we just take the example I've been giving with my, my baton, from here, I've got R's way out here, and remember that's R squared too. So that's going to get to be a pretty significant number. If I've got it like this, the biggest R's I've got are point, maybe a half a centimeter, and that's nothing. Okay? So there's a colossal difference in the math here, which certainly corresponds to the perceived amount of force I've got to use to make this thing work. It's the same reason why it's, we have to use more aggressive brakes to stop a car wheel than to stop a bicycle wheel, and so on. We can then write it further. I is then equal, sorry, uh, I misspoke. Uh, so then T sub R is equal to one half I omega squared. So one of the amazing things about all this, and I guess if you stare at it, it's not amazing, but it's amazing just staring at it, is that you have one half MV squared, and now you have one half the finagled mass for rotation times the rotational speed or uh, whatever squared. So it's, it's pretty amazing the similitude here of how these things roll together. Computation of rotational inertia, what I'm going to do in this course is limit it to uh, countable groups unless uh, unless uh, and then uh, we have certain shapes. of I. So small countable groups. Now for pencil and paper, uh, small might be two or three. If you had a machine uh, calculation, you know, you could have a few hundred or a few thousand perhaps. But, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a limit to it. Then you would just use the definition. Because computing this for a few parts. So let's suppose we take my pointer yet again here and we ignore the shaft, assume it's very thin and not very massive, and we have two balls on either side, we do this, okay? Then you'd have two masses, perhaps the same, perhaps different, separate by a certain distance, and with it where we assume that the piece in between has no mass. Uh, that would be something where you could do this quite easily. But you could also compute the math, the rotational inertia of this thing, if you think about it, it's not difficult, but we'll come back to that. Whereas if we have um, extended objects, now in second year, my professor made uh, us derive these equations. Uh, I thought it was more of an exercise in calculus and physics, so I will save you that pain. So I draw your attention then to, this is the ninth edition. Uh, I imagine it will be fairly close to your um, textbook as well. But in my textbook, it's uh, table 10-2 on page 255. It may well be um, a page or here or there, but it's going to be pretty close. And... Um, this is a page that looks like this. It has these uh, symbols in it, like this. You see that? Here, there. Okay. And so you can photocopy this table. You can't have anything else with it. It's just the table. So my, like I said, the ninth edition is 10-2. It may well be the same in 10, uh, uh, or uh, in the 10th edition. I don't know. You can keep the English in the table. Okay, so it'll say, you know, solid sphere about any diameter, whatever, 
Okay, you can keep the English in the table, you cannot, but that's it. You can't write anything on this, and you can't keep the text that's below on the same page. You can photocopy the books page if you want to scan or whatever, then you have to turn it off when you print it out. You can't write anything on the back of it. Uh, if you want to save paper, you can uh, figure out how to get this on the back of your A11 calculus uh, sheet if you wish to do so. Okay? Now, this particular table is not authorized until uh, the Chapter 10 11 test. So, this time coming tomorrow and beyond, you'll be writing the differential equations test. The next time you're in, you'll be writing test 9. So this was the systems and collisions. And then you'll be writing 10 11. Okay, so that's when this will be useful. So there's no big panic to do this, but you might want to certainly have a look because you'll be doing problem sets eventually when you get to it. Um, if the lectures get too far ahead of some of this stuff, I may or may not let some tests run or not run, uh, just so we don't get too far out of phase. However, the rotational thing for sure will run because it is a new aspect of the course and it's something that they certainly do in first year. So to make you responsible for that is to your advantage, okay? So we'll, uh, we'll let that roll out for now. <clears throat> Alrighty. So uh, again, I'm just going to say some things that matter here uh, in the sense of, so factors, we'll say, just to give you a perspective on it more than anything else. So you have, naturally, the shape is going to control this. Um, we certainly have the axis of rotation, we've already spent, mentioned that, so we'll, we'll just restate that. Number three uh, would be uh, differentiation. So is the density uniform or not? Okay? Is the, because most objects, if they're big enough, they aren't. The center part will be heavier or more massive, or you have impurities in it. You have two different types of materials or whatever, and that can easily happen even in engineering applications. Uh, you know, you have uh, something spinning and it has a certain structure on the spinning part, and then you've mounted something on the spinning part that does something else. <clears throat> Let's see what's our got here. So there's torque. I'm just going to finish this. It might be a minute or two beyond the time, but um, I think it's necessary. We just get it done and it's finished. I can make the video. So, um, parallel axis theorem. If a body is revolving about an axis whose a rotational axis is parallel <clears throat> to the revolving axis, then the total inertia of the system is the inertial of the center of mass um, when it's just spinning on its, when, it, when the axis goes through the center of mass, so the pure rotation, plus the mass of the thing uh, times h squared. <clears throat> so let's draw a little picture here. So we have this object here, and it would have the same rotational axis that would be parallel as this one. And so you'd have ICM here. And then this distance here is h. This is the distance between the revolution axis 
and the center and the axis to the center of mass. Okay, so it's not not too bad, and this is just the mass of the object. Okay. Distance between axes. Now you might have to use have your radar well established when you're getting questions in this chapter because they'll lay this on you uh, and you won't immediately expect and think that it's that type of situation. So for example, if the <clears throat> so I just want to be clear how this works. So this object does not have to be spinning, okay? What they're saying is, is if you run an axis to the center of it, compute I, it doesn't have to be spinning, it can just be sitting there, um, plus this constant here, then you get the rotational inertia of the entire system. So that's what they're basically saying. So it's a two-part process. And, uh, okay, torque. So torque is rotational uh, systems counterpart force. So we have to think of what else we do with force and account for those things as well. So, torque is defined as R cross F. This is one of the reasons rotational motion does not generally appear in high school curricula because you get into cross products and things like that which are perceived to be too difficult. So, if we have an object like this, you have a force that's coming in, let's like so. Well, that's going to be too aggressive. Let's try something a bit on an angle here. There we go. So now we have a tangential component, F sub T, and a radial component, F sub R. And F sub R uh, will not uh, aid in rotation. It does not slow it down or speed it up. It's useless. Uh, you're pushing right against the pulley and that doesn't make it go faster or slower, it's simply it's a thrust, if you will. So we care about F sub T. It's the only component we care about. And this is some arbitrary F here. <clears throat> so F sub T then is equal to M A T. And tau then is equal to this torque now, not period. S sub T R is equal to uh, M A T R. Now this is just the product here. Um, so if you recall your cross products, just to remind you, you have R F sine theta. Okay, and the R is coming out from the radius to the point. And the F in this case, is the F sub T is tangential. So you have a right angle there, and so that's always going to be 1. So that's another reason why we choose the uh, tangential component in this particular case to show what we're trying to do here. Uh, so A sub T is going to be alpha R, because the radial acceleration is, is 0 and it's irrelevant. <clears throat> and tau is equal to M quantity uh, alpha R times R, which is equal to MR squared quantity alpha. And this leads, so of course that's just the rotational inertia, right? And for a single particle. So <clears throat> the torque then is equal to I alpha. And this is Newton's second law for rotation. The 
you can see it here, force equals mass times acceleration. So it's just a matter of fooling around with the variables. We also have the work in rotational kinetic energy to satisfy dynamics the change in uh, kinetic energy is equal to one half I omega F squared minus one half I omega I squared is equal to the work. I'm going to use my works. We'll have sharp points on them for this section just so we don't mix it up with omegas. Also, D, uh, DW is equal to F dot S, F dot DS, pardon me, which is equal to FT DS, which is equal to FTR D theta. This is the definition of ds, right, based on what we think we know about uh, those variables. dw is equal then to tau d theta, <clears throat> because this is torque, right? And then work would be equal to the integral from theta i to theta f of tau d theta. So force times angle, and this is the same as force times displacement in the uh, Cartesian world. So we have basically the same issues. Now the last line or two before I let most of you go. I've got uh, power. So P then is equal to the W dt, which is then equal to tau d theta dt, which is then equal to tau omega. So when I made a mistake in the UC data, UCM thing, I think I wrote, uh, uh, what was it alpha squared r, it should have been omega squared r or something like that. So just be careful because there's lots of these little which one's squared, which one's multiplied by which to give you what. You've got I alpha here, you've got tau omega there. You need to you need to stare a little bit. This is one of the reasons why it's important to write the basic principles and equations before you solve a problem. Because writing the basic equation every time you solve a problem drills them into your head. So you don't make elementary mistakes. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is my story on rotational variables. Any questions that matter?